Hi everyone, my name is Michael and today I want to talk about authorization in Hot Chocolate 13. We already had authorization in Hot Chocolate for quite a while. I think even in the first preview versions that we had of Hot Chocolate, we already had authorization. But we did a lot of mistakes with this first push for authorization since we borrowed heavily from Microsoft's approach on REST. The authorization in Hot Chocolate was really tied to the authorization policies Microsoft introduced with .NET Core back when they started on reworking authentication and authorization. Having that said, copying the system how they did it didn't really fit into the graphical world. It was made for where you do a single REST request and then we could authenticate and authorize this specific request. In the end, the authorization system that we had in place caused a lot of performance issues with GraphQL servers that used that. And also it kind of overexposed data and started executing things that it shouldn't even do. In today's video, I will explore the new authorization system and look at various parts of it. This will actually be a series, so I'm planning to do three episodes exploring different parts of authorization. Otherwise, this would be really a one hour video. But Let's split it up and focus on different aspects. This first video will look at the basics and explain how authorization really works now with Hot Chocolate 13. By the way, we are running workshops at multiple conferences throughout the year. If you want to spend two days with Martin and me diving deep into GraphQL concepts, exploring how you can build enterprise grade GraphQL servers with Hot Chocolate and also building client applications with GraphQL, React and Relay that really scale. Join us. If you like our content, please hit the like and subscribe button below the video. And with this, let's dive in. I have a more complex project today and that's basically our workshop project. Before I dive into the code here, let's explore the schema a bit. I already started my server here and it's listening on port 5000. Let's start it and go on the GraphQL route where we have our GraphQL IDE banana cake pop and then we just create a new tab here and then we can go to the schema reference and see that there's a ton of types. Let's go into actually the column view here and then see from a query perspective how we can dive into types. So typically we query data and we have a couple of things here. We have the current user that is signed in and the current user also exposes a couple of information like address. Address is a sensitive data that we only want to expose to certain users, maybe admins and the user itself. But we don't want to expose this information if we have user information somewhere in our graph that is exposable to other users. Second thing is that we have the assets here and the assets are the base information of our crypto coins that we have in our crypto coin marketplace here. We also have here the price information. What we want to ensure is that only sign in user can access prices. So let's have a look at how we can make that happen. First, we dive into our code here and the program CS is where all the magic happens. So I already set up here the custom HTTP request interceptor. This does essentially a fake authentication. In this video, I will not look at authentication or even multi-scheme authentication. I will do a follow-up video that looks into these specific parts. So how to set up authentication. It's more in a general way, but how to set it up and combine it with our GraphQL endpoint. In general, authentication is done like in any REST service. In this demo, I skip that and we do kind of a fake authentication. So we use a basic authorization header here. And uh, if one is set, any is set, we don't validate passwords here. We will set a claims identity here on our user principle as authenticated. Let me show you that. So when we go here to our operations tab and we dive in for the currently signed in user and ask for the name and we execute that, then we get a null here because this user doesn't exist. But if we sign in, if we sign in, we can just type any username here. Then the system will tell us that the me user, in this case, ABC is available to us. So for me, I will just sign out again. So we know authentication, run that and everything is good. Okay, let's set this thing up. So we have this custom HTTP request interceptor, which enriches our request with some authentication 
information. So essentially, we just enrich the authentication information on the HTTP context. And actually the base function of this interceptor, when we call here the onCreate base, we'll get all the important bits of the HTTP context and put it here on our request builder. Before I show you how to set up authorization, let me throw some new concepts in here. So we completely redesigned authorization. We abstracted the authorization provider. I told you in the beginning that we were tied to Microsoft authorization system. That's no longer the case. So with Hot Chocolate 13, we actually have two authorization providers. The first one is Microsoft's authorization policies that come with ASP.NET Core. And the second one is called OPA, Open Policy Agent. And that is widely used also for other components like Kubernetes or databases or what have you. With Hot Chocolate 13, you can just add the package to your project and then you have open policy agent support. In this video, I will focus on Microsoft's authorization system. And to put that in, we need to add the hot chocolate ASP.NET Core authorization package. So in order to tell our schema and the execution engine that we want to use authorization here, and more specifically the Microsoft authorization policies, we have to chain in in our GraphQL configuration and authorization. And that's the same like in Hot Chocolate 12. So we kept this the same, but this is almost where the similarities end with authorization for hot chocolate. So we now have set up authorization here and we could now use our authorization directives. So if we, for instance, wanted the asset prices to be authorized, we could just go to the asset price, that's the asset price node class here, and just annotate it with the authorize directive. And you have to make sure that you take ours. You can see here's a Microsoft one, which will not work. And you have here the hot chocolate one, which will work. With this, our asset price node class is now secured. So what does it mean? In Hot Chocolate 12, if you put that on a class, what we internally would do is just apply an authorization middleware on each field of this class, which led to performance degradation because we essentially put around each of these fields an async middleware that would call this policy. And we would call this for each field. With Hot Chocolate 13, it's different. You essentially told us now that this type has to be secured. The asset price has to be secured. So everywhere in our graph where this type can now leak out, we will secure it. Let me show you in Banana Cake Pop. So if we look at this here, then we can see that the asset price can be exposed here through the price field. So what Hot Chocolate 13 will do every time you call the price field, that this price field is actually secured and that asset price is only returned if you have the rights for it. Same goes here. I have here an on price change event and that's subscription where I return the asset price here. And again, this field is also secured. We will not leak this information anymore if you call that. In Hot Chocolate 12, what would have happened is that this resolver actually would return an object, but on each field that you called on it, we would get an error that you're not authorized. The second thing we've changed is that by default, we don't validate on execution. And let me show you what that means. So my server should already be up again. So let's go back to Banana Cake Pop and go into the Operations tab. And now we query for the assets. And we just want to get the asset name. And remember that I'm not locked in. If I query that, I get an exception because we have added authorization to our schema, but we actually didn't add the authorization services from Microsoft to our server configuration. So let's just quickly go back in here to the program CS, and then we chain that in. We just will do a builder.services.add authorization here. And this will add the Microsoft authorization services to our server. So we can access them now. We will do more with this just to get started. Our server is up again. Let's go back to Banana Cake Pop, rerun that query. And now you can see that it actually works. So I can execute that. Everything is nice and we can just wrap our data here. But now we secured the price, the asset price. So if I now query for the asset price here, and maybe I want to get the last price, run that, then I get an error. I'm not even allowed to execute the query. And that's because by default, we are executing authorization policies now 
in the validation context. So before the GraphQL request is actually executed. So when you execute a GraphQL request, there are several stages. The main stages are actually, we are parsing the GraphQL request. We are validating the GraphQL request if it's semantically correct. And we are also doing other validation like, like complexity analysis, or if you're allowed to use introspection and stuff like that. And in this stage, we are collecting all the authorization information from your query. So we are essentially traversing the query, collecting all the authorized directives from your fields and types. And we are batching them in one go to the authorization engine and ask essentially, is the user allowed to access all these authorization policies? If no, we deny execution of the GraphQL request. So you don't even get to the request stage and that is security by default. We are not overexposing anything. We are not running anything. We're just telling the user, okay, hey, you don't have rights to run this query because you are asking somewhere for information that you're not allowed to have. And in this case, we can also then give you a correct 401 code because we don't give you partial data, we just give you nothing. And in this case, we can use status codes to indicate that the query didn't pass the validation stage. So if we now sign in, we can just query our data here. Let's make that more complex. Let's say we have some valuable price history data, where for instance, can get all the price points over a year from a cryptocurrency. And let's say you have to pay for that. And we want to validate that you only get access to the ones you paid for. So how could we do that? Because if we validate at the validation phase, we don't have a handle to the data and we cannot validate if you actually have access to these policies, right? So if we only validate that at the validation stage, we don't have access to the data you want to access. And thus we cannot validate if you really paid for that or not. So how would we do that? Let's dive into that. So I'm going here to the price change data, which is represented here by the price change type. That's a fluent type, by the way, this time. And in this case, we will also just chain in the authorize here. And then we will use an actual policy. And this policy we will call read history. And what you can see here is that we can see when this authorized directive is actually applied. In this case, it's applied on validation, but on validation, we don't have the data, but we also can tell the authorization engine when to validate it. We have validation before the resolver is executed. So essentially in this case, we would be in the execution pipeline of the field, but the resolver is not yet executed. So the data is not in the pipeline yet. So if I had some data in my context or I had some parent data that I need to determine if you are allowed to access, we could use before resolver. This was essentially also the default in Hot Chocolate 12, but we also have after resolver. And that means the data of the resolver is in the pipeline and I can use that data to validate if you're allowed to access that. So I'm choosing this guy here. So I want to have the data for this thing to validate if you're allowed to access it. So now with this policy defined, I can head over to the program CS where I have the authorization integration of Microsoft. And there we can just introduce a delegate here to configure this thing. Essentially, we can say we want to add a policy. In this case, I want to add the read history policy. And then I'm grabbing here the builder for my policy. And in the builder, I can say require assertion. And require assertion allows me to specify a delegate here. And this is actually an async delegate. And at the end, I can determine if I'm allowed to access it. So let's say false is our default. If we cannot determine if you have access, we just will kill it off. So now we can check for the data. So the data is actually on the context. So we are injecting it as the resource and we can probe for if it's the middleware context, then something written wrong and we don't give access. Awesome. So the next thing is that on the context, we actually have access to everything on the resolver. So I could grab arguments here. I could even get the parent. The parent in our case would be the price object, or I could get the data itself. And the data itself is here on the result property. In my case, because we are fetching data from a REST service here, it's a JSON object. So I will cast this thing to a JSON element and call that the change data. This might be different. It might be a really typed object in your case, whatever. And then we could grab from the data the symbol 
Next, we would prob on our user, on our signed in user, which we have on the context here, if the user has a scope for that. Okay, I have refactored this a bit. So essentially we are probing here for the middleware context now. We are checking that the result is there, which is our change data. And from the change data result, we grab a symbol here. And then we make sure that there is a signed in user. And with this signed in user, we will check if it has a claim. So in our case, we have a scope for each symbol. Not a good idea, but I just want to show you how you can essentially build up these dynamic policies. There could be other code involved here. At this phase, you can also use data loaders in here or whatever way you need to fetch the data because we are in the execution context. So let's try that out. At the moment, I shouldn't get access to any of this. My server's up, going back to banana cake pop here. I'm running that and now my error behavior is also different. So I get a lot of errors. Actually, I get an error for each thing that I'm not allowed to. You can see at least 10 because at the moment I don't have any permissions to any of these. And what you also can see is that change is null. So change is nullable here. And by not letting the user access this piece of data, I still get the partial results. So if your client can deal with partial results, you still get everything, but not the thing that you're not allowed to. So first we have this quick analysis at validation stage. Do you have general access to your stuff? If not, we deny it. And then you can do this more specific checks on data. Are you allowed to get this piece of information here? If not, it becomes null. If change would be non-nullable, then this error would be propagated and price would become null and so forth and so on. So you end up with a partial result that is still valid and could be used in your client. So now let's add a couple of claims so that I get access to the Bitcoin maybe. And we're gonna do that in the custom request interceptor that we have created here and in this case I'm adding a new claim and I'm adding here the Bitcoin and let's also add the uh, Cardano service up again we run the request here we still have a lot of errors here but you can see here's the Cardano that's the ADA let me add the symbol so you can see that better so now you can see I added the ADA here and now I get access for this coin to the price history so that is an easy way to do this kind of thing. We also could have dynamic policies, by the way, during the validation stage. So I also could have their dynamic policies. At the moment, if we look at price, we just added here an authorize, but I also could have dynamic checks here. So let's introduce that as read price. And let's go also for that to our program CS and add another policy. Since we are not in the execution stage, we don't have a middleware context. So in this case, you can use the authorization context, which has a lot less information, but still you have access to the schema, you have access to any services that we have on the request scope. You also have access to the global context data, so the global state that you have, and also a couple of other things like document, document ID. So the basic information that are available at this stage Stage. And through that context, you also could access the HTTP context and things like that. So I could write also here a dynamic rule that takes into account what I have at this stage. But I also could have more simple rules here. Like I could say I require a scope or a role. So maybe I just require here the role user. And I don't have that role. So at the moment, now we would get again this general check here. I'm not allowed to execute anything because I don't have the role user. But then again, I could add that into our custom HTTP request interceptor here. So I added here a claim that I have this user role if I'm signed in. And if I execute it again, I'm allowed to execute it again. I still get these partial errors as we saw because I'm not allowed to fetch all the price change objects in that list, but I get data where I'm allowed to. So if I only went, for instance, to fetch here the asset by symbol and then only asked for the Bitcoin and execute that, then I don't get any errors because I'm allowed to access here the change and I'm also allowed to access the price. So you can see how flexible this approach with authorization now is. And I don't have to be afraid of using the price data anywhere else. Like I said, it's also secured on subscriptions. So let's maybe introduce another tab here. We are not authenticated. And in this case, I'm using GraphQL over SSE here. I could also do the same with sockets. 
then writing a simple subscription asking for the on price change let's just grab the symbol and the last price run that and we get an authorization error here because yeah the object is secured not just its fields so this is much more in the way people think so i don't have to worry where my thing is exposed because it's secured and let me show you one more thing here to that Let's say we have another interface. Let this interface be iPrice. Just for demo purposes, this has just a property symbol on that. And this interface is actually implemented by our price object. So I'm going here, implement that. Yeah, I'm breaking here a bit of the rules because this is my clean data and I'm adding here in our GraphQL interface. But just to show you what this authorization system actually does. So now I have an interface here and maybe this interface actually has multiple objects that are returned. I don't know. And we're going to expose here on the asset node another resolver. Let's call that get price two. And this actually returns the price interface, right? So now this is not directly exposed anymore. If we go back to banana cake pop, refresh that, we go here and then have a look at the schema reference here. Go to asset price by symbol. That's what we have there. And there you can see the price two, which is asset price. So we can statically analyze that. And that means even though I'm not actually asking here for anything asset price related on the field two, it actually will be authenticated. But as you remember, I'm signed in. So let's just sign out. We do the request and we're not allowed because we know that this interface also returns the asset price object here. And then you have to have all the requirements authorization wise to access this data because it could be asset price. So no matter where you expose it and how you expose it, you don't have to think about that anymore because we make sure if you put an authorization attribute on a type, we will make sure that everywhere where this type is exposed, we will secure your information. Last thing, we also can do that for fields. Like I showed you always on the type here, but we also can still use that on a field basis. So I could also put on any field here, the authorize attribute and then put any policy on here, read price two, for instance. And then this would additionally analyze also by default in the validation phase. But again, you also could opt out here and say, I need that to run on the execution phase because I need to have access to the data. But what I would remember here is that doing it in validation phase is much faster. You get much better performance and you're not burdening all this general authorization rules on the execution phase and you're not producing partial data, which in many cases people don't even use. So the defaults that we have now with 13 are much better. So putting it in the validation phase, breaking early. So what do you think about the new authorization integration in hot chocolate? I know I didn't show you all of it. It's just the basic to get you started, but we took a lot of feedback here from the community and the behavior of securing objects and then tracking where they can be exposed is more in line what people expected even with our first iteration on authorization. On top of that, we are now batching authorization policies, meaning that we are executing far less of the policies or invoking the policies far less often. But still you can have the old behavior and have the policy run really in your resolver pipeline. Sound off in the comments what you think about our changes here. If you want to help our project, please go to GitHub and give us a GitHub star. And with this, I'm out.